to show us your cave live. This is Paul Stewart from Genelec, and here are my notes. We Notes! We don't need notes for this show. Where's a fun one here today? We have our guest, Jason McGurr, coming on. Uh, we're just waiting for Eric to hit the bring on our guest button. Thank you for the love. I see the hearts floating up on the side there. Thank you very much. Hey! What is up? We have him. How are you, Jason? I'm good. Uh, nice to meet you. Paul. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. We we have a mutual friend. I saw he's on. We can say hello to Patrick London if you uh, want to wave at him and say hi. Things are well in Stockholm. <laughs> so, and how are things? How are things with you? Uh, good. I mean, it's nice to have a home studio that makes sense. You know, at a time like this, pretty envious of your control room. There looks really. Uh, we have a we have a nice one here. But man, I was looking at uh, earlier today some shots of your room and I can see that beautiful wall right behind you, the stone wall. El Dorado stone. Yeah. You know what? It's good for, you know, breaking up reflections. I mean, we can go into acoustic science, but I don't know if that's what we're here to talk about. <laughs> I, from, uh, is was, was phase two of my commercial studio that I had in Seattle. And so a lot of the, the treatments, uh, room treatments that I both made and purchased wound up in here. And it's, uh, it's going to be fun to talk about because this is just a room and a house. And I know that a lot of your, a lot of your patrons are, you know, wanting a monitor that makes sense in rooms that aren't necessarily designed to make sense, you know, acoustic. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm psyched to have this conversation regardless. Awesome. So you, 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 you had a studio before, as you mentioned, and you closed it up and you took parts of that and brought it into your home. And I, I, um, when I built the studio in Seattle, um, I had a great console in there and it was just my wife and I, and it was like between touring and then when I'm not on tour being in the studio, it all made sense. And fast forward to, you know, having a few kids and moving out of Seattle, um, quite a ways north and, uh, then building another studio at home because I wasn't in Seattle anymore and buying double the equipment. It was really dumb. Well, I was like, I don't, <laughs> double the distressors, double the pre's, double the, you know, microphones. And I didn't want to pull anything from the commercial studio. So I found somebody that was looking to buy a space and I didn't own the building, but basically they, they took it over and bought a bunch of equipment from me. And uh, it's, it still exists. It's still a place. And, and I cherry picked like my, like I said, my favorite stuff and brought it home. So nice. I to tour whenever you guys want the, the full on turnaround of the cave here. Oh, I mean, if you're if you've got the ability to do it we would love no better time than the present let's uh let's go for it go for it okay yeah. well um this is a long i'm gonna start at one end of the room here so this is a in the basement of my house and it is a how can we turn the camera around? can we do that or do i turn the phone around yeah you could probably on instagram can you well i'm not, not the expert <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay, so this is a long, skinny room that opens up a bit wider. And um, basically, it makes no acoustic sense. You know, there's there's parallel walls. It's not a super high ceiling. But as you can see from treatment, um, I went to town with both diffusion, baffles, um, traps, kind of everything. And it's set up with uh, actually three drum kit stations. This is kind of a, a really minimal mono kit that I have set up. Um, it's kind of classic 12, 14, 20 vibe. Uh, and then I have a larger kit with uh, a lot more mics on it so I can get a bigger room sound. And again, this room opens up um, and is a combo, like I said, of diffusion, pyramids, traps, treatments. And this whole section of the room here is actually underground. It's all dirt. So this is officially a cave. <laughs> nice. Dude, aesthetically, it's gorgeous. I can tell you, you know, Whatever sonically, uh, aesthetically, it's gorgeous. Looks Thank beautiful. You. Yeah. Ah, this, look at this. This is the wow. desk here. I had this desk custom built. And, uh, you know, there's just enough outboard for me to get into trouble. Um, I can see that. <laughs> I can, you know, supplement with plugins. But this piece here is a quad eight sidecar that I had built. Um, it actually, the channels came out of a board that Soundgarden owned. Wow. And, I had it recapped and put together and it's got a 500 series of top so I can put whatever I want in there um, in terms of flavors of pre's, compressors, EQs. And it's a really, it's got a master section. It's great for drum tracking. 
Um, and then I don't know how much you want to get into gear if you just want me to paint. Please keep going. I mean, look at it. It's fantastic. So um, uh, Square Wave is a is a company out of Seattle. These This is his four channel mic pre here with uh, uh, I guess the easiest way to put the flavors is like a cross between a quad eight and an API. Hmm. My toms and my overheads through that a guy named Sam Winston makes these and really knows what he's doing. Um, Overstayer modular channel. Um, Jeff Terzo making an incredible piece that uh, is is like a desert island drum box or whatever. You can run full mixes through that. Silver Bullet just to kind of you know warm up or put some punch or a little bit of top or bottom onto my uh, master bus. Um, a UA guy with two Apollo X16s. Um, the pedals that I use, I use for mixing predominantly. So, um, you know, there's a lot of cool reverbs and distortions and um, things that you can add to drum mics, I think, that really make people interested in the sound of your space. And That's just really cool. And you have them kind of like where a console would be. Right. So I can do stuff in real time is the idea. Um, wow. You know, and I, I like those physical moves since I don't have a console anymore in that sense. Um, big part of my master bus chain usually flavors the TG1 or the Spectrasonic C610s. Uh, great drum bus right there and the retro revolver. Um, some weirder pieces here, the, the JFL pre's that I had. Or do you know who Frank Lacey is? The name? Uh, no. So Frank Lacey was a tech at Dennis Herring's studio. Uh, and... He built some gear for a while, and I don't think he's doing it anymore, but this, this compressor that he made is sort of like a UA-175 uh, sort of clone tube compressor. And these are tube mic pre's. The power supply is down there. You can't see them, but these are super warm and gooey. So mm. I'm favorite, favorite pre's, and that's why you see kick in and out going through there. Um, vocal stressor, you know, uh, molted basically for the EQ to go straight into the compressor. And that's on a, that's on a, a FET 47 in the middle huh. of the which is, you know, a, a big picture mic for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, and this this last Frank Lacey um, compressor here is kind of like a SSL 4000 kind of mod. And there's a 33609 diode sort of in the, in the auto setting, that sort of flavor. But again, that's it. So other than outboard compression and some pedals and some flavor pre's between the Quad 8, 1073s, Spectrasonics, and Square Wave, I mean, I have enough to get into trouble here um and the only other thing i'll show you is down at the end of the hall here i've got this separate little boiler room that's a mechanical room and it's kind of become famous with people that i work with because it's this concrete box of a room and i, I can hear it I, yeah right <laughs> yeah. But, yeah i mean like if you hit something <laughs> it goes for days oh man but it's a really cool room for uh, setting up for overdubs or percussion or just like a, a single mic um, kit. There's a few tracks out in the world where you hear, quote unquote, the boiler room. And um, I would take that as a studio name, but I think it's already taken. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah, so you've, you've, you've got everything set up. I mean, you've got how many kits? Because there, there was a percussion kit there in the boiler room as well. That's a single headed, what's called a pancake kit. It's called the DW low pro kit. And it sounds like rototoms or something. But when you, when you put a single mic in there and blow it up or run it through some distortion, I mean, it, it's the coolest thing ever. And then one of my favorite tricks is to gate those big massive sounds. So you get this huge tone that's like truncated to go with the, the timing of the song. So it's a cool flavor. Um, but really the idea, the way the whole place is set up is I sit there, I sit there, I go in the room or I have an SM7 here if I just want to work on a shaker. The idea is, and I think I learned this from maybe a Malay and hanging out in his studio, um, just having everything within reach. The idea yeah. of being stopped by anything, you know, having to plug in or source or chase down cables. But I walk in my room early in the morning, I open up the template and I hit R and I start recording. It's that easy. And it's always, for me, first take, best take. Yeah. So, I don't want to. I don't want to miss those opportunities. You know. Yeah, that's when they hit you, right? And then when you try to go back and think you're going to perfect it, that's it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it's funny. It goes full circle. We've I, in my band, we've been in situations where we've recorded songs multiple, multiple times of different arrangements, variations, and 
it's always cool at the beginning and then there's this weird lull in the middle and then maybe you come back around to like finding where a song lives or what it needs to be but um you know i mean that's a good segue to talking about these monitors these 8351b's that i have yeah given that you've seen the shape of this room right it's not like we're in massenburg design space here <laughs> like it's it makes no sense there's if i just put up any old set of monitors um there's a there's a big bump at 70 and then there's some holes like at around 100 120 um it's weird it's strange so the top end's pretty smooth but the bottom is really squirrely so being able to take the guesswork out of what i'm monitoring and listening to uh, with the glm software has been for god's sake it's been amazing and really having the information come in from other producers and mixers and being able to like make a comment that i feel confident about because i know what i'm listening to has been huge yeah it all comes together right i mean the whole thing comes together from the point of being able to sit down hit record know that you're doing what you want your inputs are correct go back and listen to it and verify yeah especially with drums because the frequency range is so broad right yeah, so like, good point right it makes you know phase when it comes to you know multiple microphones in a small room like if you don't i mean sure i can zoom in and look at waves and figure it out that way but being able to actually hear the difference and mix in mono with that kind of clarity has been it's been had, had you been uh using genlex before you got the 51s so in my my first studio was called two sticks audio it was in seattle and we started with 8040s and we also had a pair of 8020s but i mean i was I was even a fan of um, what was what was the help me? It's not ten thirty twos. The is that the yeah the ten thirty one probably was what you were thinking. Was it the the two a eight inch correct black box? But is the ten thirty two the newer model? The ten thirty two has been around just as long. It's just bigger, so that's got the ten inch bass driver. You were just uh, I just finished my tracking uh, portion. Hopefully, knock on wood. <laughs> of a new death cab record and cool. there, were, there were 1032s in the control room that we were using um past two weeks and it was nice to have some familiarity you know in that control room but so yeah i i think the very first set of monitors i had were 80 20s just because it was all that would fit in the little tiny shed that was outside my house <laughs> then i i i paid for the the 80 40s i went for it because i was in a bigger control room all right and then after that, I went to um, 80 through 51 A's, uh, which were amazing. But then when I found out you guys had expanded the filter range and um, what did you do now? You changed the, the driver, you took out a magnet or what happened? Yeah, there was a, an update to the driver complement. Uh, so the 51 A had a three quarter inch tweeter, you now have a full one inch and a new mid driver. That, that whole thing had been redesigned which now goes into the 8361 as well. So it was a way to just sort of uh, enhance the manufacturing a little bit. Well, it, they sound incredible. I, I, well, my back loves that you've actually shed some weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's good on the stands, but the, the imaging and the clarity and the um, extended phase linearity, which is incredible. I, I've actually set up my room with two different, um, uh, I guess, what you call them, snapshots or, or yeah, um, calibrations or so um, one with um, the EPL and one without where I actually went into the acoustic editor and uh, backed off the filters about one dB on everything below 200 mm. as like I said this room as a thing like I move a little ways to the right or a little ways to the left or I go back on my couch and it's quiet it's these these monitors do an incredible job but I think if I'm going to get really nerdy about it the wall construction and the ceiling construction are uh one and five eighths inch uh HX quiet rock and if anyone has never seen that stuff before it's basically gypsum a layer of sheet metal and then concrete or like dirt. wow so you are like kryptonite can't get in there yeah if i'm pretty... like sweating my ass off in this room playing <laughs> wife is upstairs she doesn't know that there's no idea Usually. <laughs> but i was gonna say is these because these walls are so thick and they have a, a density to them there's a really low end um sympathetic vibration that can 
be picked up. And I feel like that's what I'm hearing or the room is reacting to that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think with anything, I mean, whether you're super producer or getting started, like the number one thing is just know your space, right? Like, like under, listen to a lot of records and know how things are reacting, both modern music and, you know, music from the beginning of time. Like just really, really spend time listening to your room. And for me to reduce those filters or, you know, back off the filters by a dB, give it a dB more basically volume um, was helpful in the EPL setting. That it's huge. I mean, it's, I, I always tell people, it's like, you know, if you're doing a mix and you're in your Pro Tools session or whatever your DAW is and you're, you're taking the session and you save it as and you work on a different one and then you, so you always have that template, if you will, to go back to. And the same is said for like your GLM, you know, when you're working like that, as you mentioned, you did one without one that you massaged and you make your changes and you can always go back after you've had time to adjust to see if that was good. I mean, if you didn't have those tools and you weren't able to do that, how would you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I go back to things that I mixed, you know, before I had these. And also I didn't know if you saw it, but along the side, there's the 7370 sub. Right. Which is why I, you know, I give myself a little more game with the, you know, with the calibration, just cause it was, um, um, that sub being right here in this, it's, it just reacts, like I said, but yeah, I, I, I think that I need to get another set of monitors for travel, maybe the 8330s, so I can set them up wherever I go, just to, just to take that guesswork out of it, you know, just to believe yeah. in what you're, and two, I mean, I got to say this for people that are, you know, first off, let me say, I'm, super honored to be able to speak with you as such a reputable company and and you know knowledgeable individual because i'm i'm just a drummer in a band and i track here at home and i you know i reference music but i'm not i'm not you know i don't have a show full of grammys because i'm making <laughs> records but i think that because so much has come home with with us musicians you know in terms of being able to you know, record yourself, manage your own products, put your own content in the world, whether you're a content, for, you know, creator or tracking for producers at home. Like the most important thing that I tell everybody is make sure that your monitoring situation is as good That's as true. it is. That's true. Yeah. It doesn't matter the, the cost of my signal path, you know, like how many vintage mics I have or how cool. To, if it's not translating or making sense, like forget it. You're or not. if you don't know if it's translating or not, right? If you have no clue, it's not yeah. doing you any good. Yeah. No. So, and again, ever since I, I world, you know, of the ones and really being able to make sense of what I'm recording. I'm, I've gotten a lot of compliments from the producers and the engineers I've worked for and return, you know, repeat work because of it. And I, I have students that send me, um, tracks that they're working on just for reference um and sometimes it's you know we've all heard them when, when they're... <laughs> it sucks to to tell somebody you know or to hold up a the, the the acoustic mirror and like let them know what's happening uh but it's it's really important information for students and for people wanting to get into this industry it's like again you gotta make sure that you know what you're listening to right no no kidding um I'm looking to see if there's any questions. Eric, if there's any questions that have popped through, that have come through, uh, let me know here on the computer. But I want to tell anybody that's watching, if you have any questions, now's the time. This is a good time to get in. Um, I, you know, you touched on this, so I wanted to kind of expand on it a little bit. But, um, you know, when you built your studio, uh, we built our studio, obviously, in the past couple of years, the pandemic has sort of changed how a lot of us work. And... Um, and then you just mentioned that the band is, you know, you're working currently working on a new, new prod, new album. And uh, curious how much that has affected the way you go into the studio, you know, with your working from home, uh, how much of that work translates back to, you know, with the full band project. Um, I feel like it, it, it's, how can I say this without sounding like a, a jerk? Um, <laughs> pandemic the positive of this pandemic is there's not a lot of positive but i mean i in up until 2020 i had this beautiful studio and i barely used it 
like I would go on tour and be gone for, you know, seven, eight months out of the year and come home and just want to be with my family. And I didn't really um, take on a lot of work. And so this, this place was pretty dusty. But in 2020, I knew that I, I needed to work and I just started saying yes to a whole bunch of projects. So over the course of the last year, having a, having, thankfully I had foresight to build a home studio before a pandemic. Um, I worked more in here in the past, in 2020 and 2021 than I did in the past 10 years. And uh, I really, you know, got my engineering chops up and I, it was good to send stuff out to engineers, producers and get feedback, like simple questions, like just if you could change anything about my drum sound, what would you do? And they would say, well, your overhead seemed narrow or things are a bit dark in there or those that sounds spitty or whatever. And like constantly making changes. So fast forward to more 2021, um, we spent as a band, Death Cab was sending ideas back and forth every week, like a song would be written every week and we would all take turns with it. So on a Monday, somebody would start the seat of a song with their instrument. They would pass it to the next person in the band. It was always a rotating schedule. So I would maybe start with the drum seat and pass it on to the bass player. Bass player would send it to the singer. Singer would send it to the guitar player. Guitar player would send it to the keyboard player. Keyboard player would mix it. Well, sometimes I was mixing. Sometimes I was in the middle. Sometimes I was having to do edits and making cuts and like basically getting other people's tracks that they had made in their home studios and then pulling them up in my studio and making sense, both learning and thinking about what I would do differently. You know, sometimes there are programming bits that I really got into what other people were doing and like tried to mimic and copy that sound with my drums to preserve the demo. So each week we would work on a song like intensely, both as players and and then that was pre-production. The album basically Sorry, did I cut out or did you cut out? No, it was me. Sorry, oh. I got you. <laughs> anyway, it, each week was pre-production. So imagine, imagine that you're going into a studio with a band and you get to play your instrument and engineer and mix every week of the year, essentially. We took very little time off. And then you go in and you make a record at the end of the year. So, I mean, I'm not out in L.A. or Nashville being a session guy, but I'm, I'm basically being a session guy at home. And yeah. I mean, working on other projects and Death Cab, that stuff translated fabulously because we were able to knock out almost like soup to nuts a song a day with, with all of our parts and tracking and overdubs. And I mean, with the exception of vocals and those vocals went down. Um, and I just felt like, like, uh, like I'd been running every week and I went to a marathon, like that kind of thing, like really well prepared, both with my ears and with trying to get ideas in my head. Amazing. I mean, that's that's sort of the take that I was sort of getting when we built this room. We this was our demo room, and then it became, you know, like, well, we're not traveling. Let's build uh, an immersive space, you know, and that's what I've got here. And uh, then there was the learning curve of understanding that, you know. And then you look at the time that goes by, and you're like, man, we've learned a lot. <laughs> so, like, you know, for a band to take the time, take that opportunity to expand and grow that good, good for you guys you know that's using the time well spent well and it was also nice because you can't you know even if we were writing in 2020 and 21 and that's a lot of songs that get written but what the greatest thing is that it boils down to just a handful that make a record yeah so it's not going to be any filler it'll all be killer um we did get some questions that came through and i'll i'll see if i can ask these to you uh Somebody was looking to set up a home studio for a drum kit. What's the best starter setup for interface and speakers? <laughs> I would say uh, whatever the best, whatever your entry point is with Genlock is your, is your monitor, of course. And I would spend more money on your monitors than your interface, personally. Um, and, you know, I like I said, I'm, I, I think UA makes... I, it, Look, converters are great these days across the boards. I mean, there I you go. It. Yeah, it's a true I, thing. They stuff because of the interface with all the plugins, how easily it is, how easily it works. Um, the Apogee stuff sounds great, but for bang for the buck, I think the Focus Right is a is a great entry point. Um, the Scarlet is really inexpensive way to get into making a studio. You just need to come up with your budget. Actually, find your Genelec monitors that you want. <laughs> And then come up 
based on that. How much more above can you go? And then I would invest in a, probably a better microphone than an interface or two or three. And drum set wise, um, if you have three mics, even two uh, would be great to start. Just remember that your interface is going to need to accommodate the number of microphones you have. So right. don't go out and buy a tiny interface that only has two inputs and then buy a third microphone, right? <laughs> um, but the other thing that's important is I tell this to, um, this is aside from like tech, tech stuff at all, but your drums will have a sound in your room, whatever given space you're recording in. Make sure that your drums are not too loud for your room. Mm. So you don't want to oversaturate your space with sound because that's not going to do your microphones and your recording any good. So if I have, for instance, the thickest, loudest, largest cymbals on this drum set, my drum sound is going to stuck in this room because I only have a nine foot ceiling and I need to play appropriately to this acoustic environment. So think about it like this. If you go to play a gig and you're in a room where you need to play to the level of conversation or you're in a giant arena and you get to play your ass off because the ceiling is huge and there's a PA. That's how it works. So make sure that you play to your space and your microphones, whether they're weird Japanese, you know, thrift shop mics or like a Neumann, uh, and whether you have a cheap interface or a set of burls, everything's going to work out. If you, your hands and your feet are playing appropriately in terms of volume and dynamics to capture your recording. That's the best answer right there. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, that's the truth. It's like totally legit. So in, in your space, um, you've got the three kits, the mm -hmm. your, your main or large kit, let's say. Uh, and so in your space, how many microphones do you typically have on that? On the, on the, the big kit, I have it. Two baser mics, Beta 91 and a D25. Sometimes that's a, a, a Fat 47. On the snare drum, I have an M88 on top and a 57 on the bottom. On toms, I have ATM 25s, so two tom mics. So two, four, six. And then overheads, I vary from KM84s to Telefunken FET 60s to Shure um, 143s? I can't remember. I haven't. Okay. Even, uh, what are they? One ASM 141s. Oh, okay. And, and here, perfect examples. Back to what, so actually that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have an R88 as an overhead ribbon that's in line. I can show you the R88 and the, the overheads um, are basically the diaphragms of the equal distance from the snare drum so that I know that it's in phase. I also an equal distance from the two walls. So I know that like basically the way this kit is out from the corner is like I measured all the mics from the side of the wall so that things are, have a, have a central image and that they're in phase. Um, the only other mic I have is a ribbon mic that's 15 feet away in that boiler room that I showed you guys that gets the big, um, that gets the big sound wish I could solo and send you a mix right now. Anyway, so if I really want depth in the recording, if I want to sound like Bonham when the levee breaks or just have some real um, natural reverb, that is my reverb room at the end of the hall. So I think it's, let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 tracks of drums and uh, two of them are stereo. So that being said, sometimes it's five mics. It's whatever works best for the song. I don't use all those necessarily, but it's nice to have the flavors. And within a drum take, sometimes I might start the track with the single ribbon far away, or uh, the FET 47 is really dry and gated, you know, or compressed or something. And that's like the intro verse. And then I open up all the microphones when it comes to the chorus. So, yeah. That's, that. that is such a cool thing to do. You know, uh, I'm not sure how many people would think of recording their drums that way. Well, you can get into trouble. I will say this. Make sure, <laughs> make 
picture you have good time and you good feel don't get all caught up in the i mean i've been recording drums since 2002 uh my own drums and it's only been in the past you know i would say five or six years that you can actually those songs are popping up on the radio so i i, I mean outside of death cap like things that i've been in control of mm -hmm. is the only thing about recording at home because i think it's important information I have my studio computer and then I have a laptop next to my kit that I can be on Zoom and I can I have three cameras set up, one side of my kit, one overhead and one by my feet. And that's really helpful when I'm working with people remotely. So we can jump on Zoom and I can send them a listen to link and they can hear my studio audio. I can even share my screen with them and they can actually move faders if they want on the studio computer. But they can sit, you know, I can basically sit right next to me as if they're looking through glass and we could talk through arrangements and, you know, um, put together a track. And um, then I usually say goodbye and I go to work and then I send them a folder with raw files and everything they need to mix their records. Man, that is fantastic. That is the coolest thing. And, and on, so uh, on top of that, you've got uh, students as well. You've been uh, teaching. And I've been teaching since um, since my early days in Seattle, a um, long time, since almost 30 years, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I have a handful of students that some of them are every other week, some are every week, some are twice a week, some are like once every six months, they lose their way, they can't see the forest through the trees, and they're like, give me something to work on. <laughs> Funny how a lot of the, the lessons have switched from, say, doing rudiments and learning you know, traditional drum set patterns to like, how do I get a good drum set? Or can you walk me through uh, this, this recording and maybe talk about EQ and compression and editing and like, how can I, how can I record myself? I mean, that, that is probably the most common question these days is how can I sound better recording myself at home? Well, well you've answered a lot of that today for everybody, for sure. <laughs> um, so the uh is the band we're working on a new album is there uh you guys getting back out on the road anytime soon or what's the plan there we have some shows on the books um in 22 um coming up in the in the spring and into the summer but um we are we have yet to set a, a release we have to finish our record first make sure it's all good and then um we, you know the idea is as long as the world doesn't put a stop on it to have a record out sometime this year be able to support to support the record but until then i'm 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 loving every hour i can be like in my basement working on music <laughs> that's awesome I, I love i love the space i hope everybody got it that's been on it's been on since the beginning to see but uh i just think that the the idea of having your console with your with your effects pedals right there so you've got all your input devices ready to go at hand yeah uh, um for any i don't know if anyone um jumped off but i'll show one more time like having all this stuff right here that like i mean I, I rarely unpatch anything that's that's my patch bay that accommodates every piece of outboard and i just have everything i'm, I'm a logic user and, and everything is already labeled on an io so when i pull up you know and and insert basically i just choose effects chain and then it's uh any number of these things some of these are are grouped and some of them are individual but Basically, the idea is I don't have to. I don't have to get out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> that is just yeah. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, I, we kind of already answered a lot of this um, just because we've been talking about things and it's been going. And uh, um, let me see if I can find anything we might have missed here. Bear with me one second. Oh, no problem. I uh, I don't know if I'll ever. Uh, this is not the space for Atmos or surround in any way. But if anybody can do it, you guys can. <laughs> you guys can. <laughs> well, you know that's a good good follow through here. Like you know, uh, have have some back catalog stuff been reformatted for Atmos, or has that been something that's been talked about? It has been talked about. Yeah, and we um, that is something that I think you know, like Apple is 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 definitely wanted to get as much spatial audio as they can on the platform. And um, uh, we've done some live stuff that I think is in 5.1, but 
isn't uh, out yet. Um, but, you know, it's funny. I admire it. I love it. But I am still trying to wrap my head around making sense of the stereo. And <laughs> well, it's like as a drummer, right? How much of it do you want to segment out <laughs> into multiple speakers? <laughs> I don't I don't know. It's like if I had a bigger kit, if I had like a wraparound kit and I had China's back here and like, <laughs> you know, four toms all the way around at, you know, six o'clock, like I think it would make a lot of sense. But <laughs> I I applaud everyone that I know and all the producers that I recently have spoken with that, that are like building up. They're like, hey, you know, I'm, I got seven one now. Like if you guys want to want me to mix anything, I'm like I love it. I love they're going for it. You got to keep with the times. Um, I'm I'm not going to be there this year, <laughs> maybe next year. Uh, like I said, trying to make sense of it all is uh, with just a stereo mix. Is, I'm I'm. Let's just say I got a lot more work to do there before I am. <laughs> um, someone did ask if you were still accepting students. I am. Yeah, you gotta you gotta DM me on Instagram is the easiest way, um, and I will. Uh, We'll get into that. I had a lot of different requests, and I, I don't always get to them all. Um, yeah, but yeah, I do do that, and I I love to help people out in whatever ways I can. Uh, schedule permitting, and when I'm on the road, I'm not teaching. But um, yeah, I think too that being a being a teacher is also being a student, right? Because people present questions that you maybe hadn't thought of or you have to think of in a different light or a different way. It's just like being an engineer. Somebody brings in an instrument you've never had to put a microphone in front of or whatever, you know, you, right? People sing or present music or play a certain way, and it's a new challenge to you. It's the same thing with students. Like, I become a better player. And, and I think engineer and you know, a bit of a, a producer when you have to talk people through difficult you know, problems they need to, you know, when you need to get a performance out of somebody, it's the same thing. If I was engineering a record, like when I'm asking a student to do something that is, uh, is challenging for them, of course, they're going to be self-conscious about it and unsure about how to move forward. But when you actually get there together and there's a reward and you can hear it and it feels good and everything like that, like I said, whether you're capturing, you're documenting as an engineer, producer, or as a teacher, like helping to guide students of any age, um, it's super rewarding. You guys hear that? There you go. This is a, a great drum teacher to get, get if you can get him. <laughs> Patrick, um, our friend Patrick actually has taken a few lessons. Oh, he is? Yep, he's a great drummer. I don't know why he's taking lessons. He doesn't need him. He is a great drummer, and I can verify that because I've played with him before. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. In Finland, we had a Christmas party, and uh, we played. And you know how you were saying about Know the Room and how loud... <laughs> Be careful. We had this goes to guitar players. They really need to understand this, probably more so than drummers sometimes. <laughs> but you're a guitar player, aren't you? Sadly, yeah. <laughs> um, question for you: What do you what do you like most from drummers? What what defines a great drummer for you? Or maybe you're getting rim dynamic. I don't know. You know what you said, what you had touched on about um, knowing the volume of your kit? To me, that means everything. Um, a drummer that knows how to play to a level that you can talk or go all the way up, that understands that dynamic, that is the key to me. Um, so. Well, and it's the key to getting great drum sounds. I mean, yeah, say all, all together. A lot of people think that destroying your drums, I mean, it, it's a thing, right? If you want to just bash the hell of your drums, it is a thing if you have a space that could support it. But there's so much magic in playing quiet and letting yeah. like, pressers and pre's do their work, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned it You mentioned it earlier, uh, when the levee breaks. Isn't that the classic, like, every drummer wants to get that big sound? They're looking for it, and, um, you know, yeah. do you ha have to get it from a castle? Or... <laughs> Well, recently I got it at a at United Recording, the old Ocean Way. And when you open up a room that big, um, with great microphones, it's yeah, it's like there it is. That's that sound. Uh, but uh, I gotta use plugins here. <laughs> <laughs> that. But yeah, it's um, I think it's it should be said again that like conversations with other musicians and producers and engineers, like I have asked questions my whole life 
um, ever since I was 15 years old in the studio for the first time, trying to figure out how to play 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. Um, and I just, I just ask questions. How can I be better? How can, how can this, and one of my favorite comments from somebody that I knew years ago was, I said, what can I do to be a better drummer? And he said, learn how to burn quiet. Burn like, quiet. As in, like, learn how to really play your ass off super quiet. I was like, oh, I'm going to figure that out. Because usually we just, we think that in order to play hard and fast, like, we really got to dig in. But if you can do it quietly, this is why I think a lot of jazz guys are such amazing musicians, because they started in coffee shops or small clubs where they, they couldn't be very loud, like we were talking about. So they had to develop their skills in really low dynamics. Excellent. Um Let's see. I think that might be the last. No, nothing new came in. I guess we're getting close here. We're coming down to the wire. But uh, Jason, I want to thank you for, for coming on and being a part of this whole thing. Um, you've been fantastic. Um, as we mentioned before, anybody that is looking for a drum teacher, uh, mm -hmm. DM is the way to go for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eric, do you have something there? that you? No. We have our producer. Hold on a second. We have to just show him right here. There he is. What's up, Jason? How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. <laughs> mask. Right. Gotta have the mask. You know, we try to be as uh, good about it as we can, but obviously it wouldn't be good for me to wear it right at the moment, so. Yeah, it'd be muffled. Yeah, we, yeah I think we're all doing what we can. Yep. Um, hopefully, by doing what we can do, um, the world of touring and you know, live shows and live music and bodies in the studio and you know, all that interaction can start up again. I will say that over the course of the past year, everyone that I know that has been writing music at home is writing from an obviously truly deep and cathartic place. So I think the world needs to prepare themselves for some pretty amazing music. That's that's the most enlightening and like, you know, positive way to look at what's been happening. Uh, and I agree with you on that. It just seems like the, from the musicians I know where people are really kind of, you know, you're you're sitting at home or you're you're working, you have time to reflect and we play it out. Um, someone did ask, uh, favorite drum part you've written? Um, probably Kids of 99 off of uh, the Blue EP um, that was post our last record. Um, we had some songs left over after Thank You For Today. Um, and we worked with Peter Cadis for um, a few of those songs. And then there were a few that Rich Costi um, had captured on the last record. And then one we did ourselves. Uh, but the song Kids of 99 is, um, the, the lyrics are about uh, kind of a tragic event in, in the small town of Bellingham where I grew up. So they're meaningful to me, but the drum sound is a really crazy, like you couldn't treat a drum set more in terms of like preparation. Like there was a broken distortion pedal on top of the snare drum head and I had a multi rod in one hand and a drumstick in the other, and I cranked heads and put towels over floor toms and played super light with the lightest maple drumsticks you could find. And uh, the sound that Peter got was pretty epic, and it's a it's a great groove. Um, and there's a at the end of the song there's a a double um, double drum performance. So I basically there's the the intro groove and a, a double of myself playing on the back end with a bigger kit. So again, if you're going to have a studio and you're going to go for it, like I'm all for one drum set, one microphone, great performance, but we have all these amazing tools at our disposal and productions come such a long way. So I think that on recording is one of my favorites. Otherwise, um, my great bun fires shuffle is maybe my, my favorite to play live. You mentioned uh, Rich Costi. I've, I've had uh, opportunity to talk with him over the year, helping him get us set up with uh... do that. Yeah. How, how do you like working with him? You guys worked with him quite a few times. Yeah, we've done two records with Rich, but I, he, I remember he was, he called me, we were working together on, on something. Um, I think it was a, a Frank Turner record, uh, which is coming out soon. Um, and he was like, just moved to Vermont. He's like, I'm thinking about going surround here. I, what do you think about the Genelec? And I was like, all for it. So if you guys actually did set him up, like I, I 
I should get some credit for that one. <laughs> Give it to you right now. <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah. He, he yeah, he was an ATC guy. So um I uh which are also great monitors, but I I'm a bigger fan of your monitors, so I, I think that's great. Good to hear. Yeah. No, um, there are a lot of good monitors out there. You, you touched on something that was so important for people to really go back to. is like to understand your room. That tells you so much. And how those speakers are translating in the room, if you don't know, if you have no way of knowing, it, you're never going to get there. There are basic setup stuff, but, you know, have tools that can help tell you what's going on. Obviously, GLM is a huge factor in that, but uh, it's really important. I can't imagine wasting weeks on an album and not knowing how it's going to translate. Yeah. That world. And I mean, sometimes I, I will do that. I'll put my head down. People will give me source tracks and I'll work on something. They're busy doing another project and I'll be on my own just going for it. I've, I've got the free license. Of like, just we trust you, do what you do. Um, I can't imagine spending a week or more on something, you know, every day, standing at a, somewhere and having someone be like, Ugh, this is a mess. Yeah. Because it didn't translate. Because what I thought I was hearing was the right thing. You know, and it's the opposite. But yeah, again, best, best product out there. It's really been an amazing, um, amazing platform to be able to uh, feel confident as well, I, I record. Happy to have you on board with us and you know maybe we can uh, touch base later on in the year to see where things are at we'd love to follow up with you um and uh band comes around our way in the spring or summer yeah we'll have to studio in boston yeah ah, perfect i would love to yeah that, that is a that is always a stop so i'd love to see the space excellent well we'll ha love to have you definitely well thank you again appreciate uh, it our pleasure. Absolutely. You take care. All right. See ya.